continue our series entitled Truth Wars with today's message entitled Apostates, Their Description, and Their Destiny. Now, we've had a week off, and so I don't want to take for granted that you have full recollection of where we left off in the last message, which was basically, we basically identified the enemy of the truth, and we named that enemy in, in one word, and it's called apostate. Jude was dealing with those who would come in uh, with evil desires and intent into the church. As a matter of fact, in verse 4, it says that they crept in unnoticed. And then they lived a life and they taught doctrines that both were immoral and also denied uh, the one and only Lord Jesus Christ. And, and, and what he said after that is that we must earnestly contend for the faith which was once and for all handed down to the saints. The truth was under attack. The truth was 
being assaulted. But it wasn't an enemy from without. It was an enemy within. The most and greatest danger to the truth doesn't come from the atheist or the agnostic, from the skeptic nor the cynic. From those who stand outside and throw stones at the windows. But it comes from the ones who are within who come in, as Jesus said, dressed in sheep's clothing until the time is right. Much like in the 20th century when we experienced the post-World War II era of spies and and intrigue and all these things that, that you had people who would go deep cover. That's very much what Jude is dealing about as he's talking about people who have come into the midst of the fellowship of a local congregation who have the appearance, who have the language, but yet do not have a relationship. Thank you, Leanne. They know of God. They know of the Christ, but don't know and are not known by. Kind of like Simon the magician who wanted the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts And when he began to speak to the demons, the supernatural spiritual world of demonics, they said, we know Jesus, we know Paul, but who are you? That's these ones that are named apostate. And apostates, Jude says, are here. Whereas Peter writing probably 20 years before says, they're coming. Jude, the half-brother of Jesus, says, they are are here therefore earnestly contend for the faith which was once and for all handed down to the saints last time we described the enemy we described the enemy and his coming they crept in unnoticed we also described the character of the enemy which Jude called ungodly meaning without God without a relationship, without a connection, a direct relationship to God. And he said that the conduct was licentiousness. Most all and just about, if you think about it, the people who are unmasked, unveiled, and revealed as apostates live a life of great immorality. Licentiousness, that's what it means, immorality. And then the creed was also unveiled about these apostates they were deniers and disobedient of God and also Jesus and so that's what we talked about last time that we're here this week we want to begin to get in to a description or literally an illustration that Jude is going to give us and what it's going to do for us it's going to teach us about the destiny of the apostates and it's also going to give us a description of what an apostate looks like so we might be better able to understand when we see them the apostate so let's begin today by turning to the epistle of Jude right before Revelation standing in the shadow of Revelation this little letter very important for us even today reading verses 1 through 7 read with me in the epistle of Jude, Jude, a bondservant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to those who are called beloved in God the Father and kept for Jesus Christ, may mercy and peace and love be multiplied to you. Beloved, while I was making every effort to write to you about our common salvation, I felt the necessity to write to you appealing that you contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all handed down to the saints. For certain persons have crept in unnoticed, those who were long beforehand marked out for this condemnation, ungodly persons who turn the grace of our God into licentiousness and deny our only Master and Lord Jesus Christ." Now I desire to remind you, though you know all things once for all, that the Lord, after saving a people out of the land of Egypt, subsequently destroyed those who did not believe. And the angels who did not keep their own domain but abandoned their proper abode, he has kept in eternal bonds under darkness for the judgment of the great day. 
just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them, since they, in the same way as these, indulged in gross immorality and went after strange flesh, are exhibited as an example in undergoing the punishment of eternal fire. Let us pray. Lord, as each has need, open our eyes to what stands right in front of us each and every day. People who name Christ as Lord, but yet have only a vain semblance of Christ in them. They're like Jesus said about the Pharisees, whitewashed tombs appearing beautiful on the outside, but inwardly are full of dead men's bones. May we have eyes to see, ears to hear, and a heart to apply your teachings today. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. What we have here today, and probably what we will not get through today, these verses 5, 6, and 7, are three illustrations that Jude is giving us that help us to understand also the destiny as well as the description or a picture, if you will, of what apostasy really is. Now, I said at the last message at the end, I went through great detail of what apostasy is and is not. Well, I want to say this again. Apostasy is not a born-again believer recanting or refusing or walking away from the faith. That is not the definition of that. Now, it might be in Merriam-Webster's dictionary, but it's not in the Bible dictionary. Apostasy, as you'll see today, is not that at all. So let's take a look at example number one. Disbelieving. I'd, I'd, I'd put these in D's. Disbelieving Israel is the first one. Secondly, disobedient angels. And then third is depraved men. Three examples. Disbelieving Israel, disobedient angels, and depraved men. Disbelieving Israel. Now I remind you, verse 5 says... Though you know all things once for all, Jude is saying, remember, don't forget. You've already learned this. Recall to your memory these things. That the Lord, after saving a people out of the land of Egypt, subsequently destroyed those who, what's that say? Did not believe. Did not believe. Let me be absolutely clear. The Lord gives common grace to billions of people in history. Right now, there's approximately 8 billion people on this planet. God gives children indiscriminately a common grace to many of those 8 billion people. He gives life indiscriminately. To 8 billion people. That is a grace gift of God just to be alive. But not all believe in, as in put their trust in God. Put their trust in Jesus. And so there's a difference here when we say those who did not believe. The illustration is clear. Were not the Israelites God's chosen people? Answer, yes. Were they not God's apple of his eye? Yes. Were they not delivered from Egypt in a multitude of ten miracles, what we sometimes call plagues? Yes. Did they not see the Red Sea open and parted? And did they not go through? And did they walk on dry land? And did they see Pharaoh's army swallowed up and killed? Yes. Did they get thirsty in the land? Did they get water from a rock? Now, who gets water from a rock? That's kind of like getting blood from a turnip. Did he not prepare? Did he not provide did he not prove himself all throughout their experience see experience they had an experience with Jehovah God though they had been there 430 years God came and rescued them out of the land of Egypt and he proved time and time and time and time again who he was even though they did not even know his name they had to ask even Moses had to ask who are, who are you I am who I am, came from the burning bush. I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I'm the deliverer. I'm the Savior. 
Yet, they did not believe. This is not talking about a tacit mental assent to a set of data or facts. They had an experience which was, it was indisputable. But yet they did not trust. They did not go from fact to faith. They didn't make the transition from I am to I am his and he is mine. They did not believe. And so it is with apostates. They might have facts, but they do not trust. They do not put themselves in and under the master. They might want him for savior in an intellectual way, but they never commit to being mastered, despotanes. That's where we get the word despot. Remember, Paul said in Romans 6, you are a slave to that which you serve, either a slave to sin or slave to God. We come under in submission in that act of truly believing. Apostates will always have an experience. They will always experience a power or a work of God. But in reality, they fail to fully come to Jesus under Jesus' authority. We study in right now, we are studying right now the Beatitudes on Wednesday nights. They are never poor in spirit, wrecked by their own destitute bankruptcy before God because of their sin. They're never get to the point to where they admit and they admit who they are and who God is and their desperate need for Him. They never do that. Numbers 14. Listen to this. After the spies had gone into the promised land, remember, 12 spies went in, 10 came back, 10 bad reports, evil reports is what literally the text says. 10 evil reports, only two good reports, Caleb and Joshua. You remember that, right? The whole night after the initial report was given, this is what happened. Number 14, 1. Then all the congregation lifted up their voices and the people wept that night. All the sons of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron. And the whole congregation of them said, Would that we have died in the land of Egypt or that we would have died in the wilderness. Why is the Lord bringing us into a land to fall by the sword? Our wives and our little ones will become plunder. Would it be better for us not to have returned to Egypt? So they said to one another, let us appoint a leader and return to Egypt. Numbers 1, 14, 1 through 4. They had an experience. But they didn't believe in the experiencer. Joshua, verse 6, Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Jephthah, of those who had spied out the lands, tore their clothes, and they spoke to the congregation of Israel, saying, The land which we have passed through to spy out is exceedingly good land. The Lord is pleased with us. He says, If the Lord is pleased with us, then, if, then, if he's pleased with us, then he'll do it. He will bring us into this land and he'll give it to us, a land which flows with milk and honey. Only do not rebel. Hear that? Only do not rebel. Unbelief is rebellion against God. Only do not rebel against the Lord. And do not fear the people of the land. You know, the fear of man, Proverbs says, is a snare. But there's safety in the Lord. Only do not rebel against the Lord. Do not fear the people of the land, for they will be our prey. Their protection has been removed from them. And the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. But all the congregation said, stone them with stones. Then the glory of the Lord appeared at the tent of the meeting of all the sons of Israel. And the Lord said to Moses, listen to this. How long will this people spurn me? And how long will they not 
believe in me. Despite all the signs which I have performed in their midst. How long will they spurn me? How long will they not believe me? How long will they not believe all the things that I've performed right in their midst? Apostates always have an experience that has some tacit relationship to a knowledge or a body or a group. And the ones that Jude is warning us about are the ones that could be right here today. Later, same book, Numbers 14, verse 22. Surely all men who have seen my glory and my signs which I have performed in Egypt and in the wilderness, yet they have put me to test, to the test these ten times and have not listened to my voice. God counted each and every time that they acted unfaithfully. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Verse 23. They by no means shall see the land which I swore to their fathers. Nor shall any of those who spurned me see it. He goes on and he says... Your sons, verse 32, verse 33, your sons shall be shepherds for 40 years and they will suffer for your unfaithfulness until your corpses lie in the wilderness. According to the number of the days which you spied out in the land, 40 days, every day you shall bear your guilt one year for 40 years and you will know my opposition I, the Lord, have spoken, surely I will do to all this evil congregation who are gathered against me. In this wilderness, they shall be destroyed, and they will die. We have a picture or a description or an illustration of the apostate's unbelief, which sets them apart, even though they might be in the midst of a congregation But yet, God sees and knows. Their destruction is assured. Back in verse 4, this is what we read in Jude. Look again, it says, For certain persons have crept in unnoticed, those who were long beforehand marked out for this condemnation. Where I might not see it, and you might not see the apostate, God has no issue whatsoever knowing the heart of a man or a woman were these not israelites yes were they all saved and delivered from egyptian egyptian bondage yes did they all go into the promised land no why unbelief unbelief the next two examples which will come next week. Some of you are going, Whew. Disobedient angels and depraved men. Again, exhibit the characteristics, the character of the apostate. What, 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 what have we seen today? Go back through this. We've seen the destiny of the apostate is assured. We've seen the description of the apostate. The earmark thing is that they are unbelievers. They're not with God, but actually are against God. They have some knowledge of the truth. And today, that might mean that they have knowledge of Jesus. But yet they don't have a bona fide relationship with him. They might have an association with the people of God. They might, not, they might know all the words and buzz phrases, but they don't submit themselves under God as a true believer will. Now, that's not saying that we're perfect, those who are saved. That's not what this is about. The pattern of life that John speaks about, no one who is born of his seed continually lives in sin because 
his seed is incapable of sin. Meaning your manner of lifestyle, your practice of living is not that of what it was before. Because what the old has been dispatched, the new has brought in. And so let's make clear that the apostates have the appearance but are devoid on the inside of a personal relationship. And that's one thing that our generation has been sorely apt to miss. Many of you know that I've taken up some extracurricular sporting activities of the last year or so. And I met a man uh, in those activities. And he had the outward appearance of that. But let me just ask you a question. If you were to meet someone and they say that I'm a Christian... And then turn around and say something like this. I believe Jesus was just a man just like me and you and that he sinned. Could that person be saved by that Jesus? He's in the church every week. He's an apostate. That's an apostate. And I looked right at him right in front of Sylvia and I said you can't be saved believing that. That's the truth. That's the war that we have today against the truth. Everybody wants their own Jesus. Everybody wants their own way. There's one way, Jesus said. I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father except through me. John 14, 6. And John 6, 44 says, No one comes to the Father except the Spirit draw him. I can't save anybody. You can't save anybody. It's a work of God. All we are is seed bearers and waterers. Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, I planted, Apollos watered, and guess what? God gave the increase. No, we're not supposed to walk around like Inspector Clouseau uh, questioning everybody and every time, are you really real? But Jesus said, by their fruit you will know them. This is serious because our world, the world system, our enemy, the Antichrist uses apostates to infiltrate, to corrupt good doctrine and lead astray, Paul said, even the elect, if possible, in these latter days. What can we do? Number one. You must know the person of truth. Jesus is the person of truth. He was the one who came to explain who God is in vivid fleshly details. Remember after John 14, 6, Jesus is having this conversation. Philip says, well, show us the Father and we'll believe. And he says, have I not been with you so long and let you do not know still that if you have seen me, that you've seen the Father? John 1.18 says, no one has seen God at any time, but Jesus came to expiate or uh, excuse me, uh, to exposit and literally in the Greek is to explain God to us. We must know the person of truth, Jesus Acts chapter 4, Peter testified before those who were listening at the Sanhedrin or the council and said, there is no other name given among men that men must be saved. Who was he speaking about? Jesus. He didn't say Jesus and Deepak Chopra. He said Jesus. You must know the person, number one. Number two, you must know the word of truth. The, the idea that, that being saved is all you need is not true. You need to grow up, as Peter would say. Grow up in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Peter 3, 3.18. 3.8, excuse me. We must meditate, as Joshua was told. Meditate on this word day and night. Why? So that we would be materially wealthy? No. So that we would know God. We would know truth. And then that is success. And that is to be prosperous. And then thirdly, we must live the truth. 
John said it like this in 1 John chapter 3. And everyone who has this hope fixed on him purifies himself just as he is pure. Everyone who practices sin also practices lawlessness. And that idea of practice there is an ongoing, ever-ending, never-ending lifestyle. And all sin is lawlessness. Either you're practicing this or you're practicing godliness. You're practicing ungodliness or you're practicing righteousness. And a part of that is this. What is happening all over right now. Probably in your life at some place you don't even realize it. Jesus said it this way. Let your light shine in such a way that man might see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Shannon is an example of that. But let me tell you. A word of encouragement at the right time is just as valuable. When you see that cashier or that clerk or that driver, you don't know just on the outside looking at them sometimes what a word of encouragement might mean to them. In a desperate, in a dire, and in a hopeless situation, people need Jesus. They need to name Jesus. Sometimes it's with a bottle of water. And sometimes it's literally with the name Jesus. That's how we inoculate ourselves from apostasy and the apostate. We know the man of truth, the word of truth. And we live that word of truth. Come back next week. We'll talk about the two other descriptions of the apostate. Today, I want to ask you to reflect. To reflect. I want you to answer this question to yourself. If someone were to ask you this question, how would you answer this question? What does it take for a person to be saved? What does it take for a person to be saved? Here's why I ask that question. Because if you can't answer that question, you're in trouble. That's the truth. You need to come see me. And we need to talk. Maybe not here today, but we need to talk. Sometimes we're far too casual. This is serious business. This is eternal consequences. This life is but a blip on the radar compared to eternity. Don't let this one pass by. And put the other one at jeopardy. You come today as the Lord leads today. I'll be down front as our singers come and our instrumentalists come for our invitation hymn today. You come as the Lord leads. Let's all stand for our invitation hymn today.